our Duke Majin. And we're getting ready to get started on a Duke laser disc repair, L34, L45, L5S1, left approach. This patient has back and left leg pain. He has three herniated discs at those three levels. You can see we're getting started. Are you comfy? Yes, sir. As, as always, the patient is awake in the beginning. Shut. And that way they can help me. By the way, Jordan, great job on the x-ray picture. They can help me get to where I need to be. Shot. Now, where are you visiting us from? North Carolina. Where? North Carolina. North Carolina. Okay. Give me an AP, please. So I'm talking to my team, all right? And we're just getting everything set up so we can do that surgery on those discs. Now, for those of you who have never seen a Duke laser disc repair procedure, what's unique about it is we're actually approaching the spine through a hole that's already there called the neural foramen. And that's where the nerves come out of the spine. It also happens to be the exact place where nerves get pinched. Okay, so for example, this patient has three herniated discs and all three disc herniations are pinching the nerves coming out of those holes. So they're causing horrible sciatic pain for him. And uh, he can't even get out of bed. How long have you been pretty much bedridden? I don't mind him being sleepy. Huh? Two weeks? He hasn't been able to get out of bed for two weeks. So, Are you awake? Yes, uh, yes sir. All right. Are you comfy? Yes, sir. So you can see the needle. I'm low in the foramen where you want to be. You don't want to be up by the pedicle because that's where the nerve exits, the L5 nerve root. So we're in perfect position. You doing all right, buddy? Yes, sir. All right. I'm sliding in just underneath the facet and shot. Yeah. There's a little bit of rotation there. Let's see where we are. Shot. AP. So we're right at the back of the disc at 5-1. It's where we want to be. Encountering a little bit of resistance. All right. And it may be the end plate of S1. Or the inferior end plate of L5. It could be either one. So I need Jordan to line that up and maybe get a better view. Uh, you comfy? You all right? Uh, yes, sir. All right. Shot. Hmm. Let's give some more numbing uh, for the skin. You know we're at the skin, right? Yeah, yeah. Just going to give you a little more numbing medicine. Is that uncomfortable? No, no. no huh? Yeah. All right. Okay, good. So the advantages of this surgery and the patient's wife if you don't mind me saying your wife is a doctor, um, she, who found us by the way, you or her? Uh, me. Okay, pretty good. So, recognize, you recognize what we're doing is different. And just to give you a little bit of history on this type of surgery, the approach that I'm doing is called transferaminal. Uh, Blood pressure is a little high. Let's see if we can bring it down a little. Uh, when I say high, it's still normal, but I like it lower than it is. So don't freak out and think it's too high. 
the approach here is called a transforaminal approach. And you can actually see he's got a pars defect at L45 there. So the transforaminal approach was developed by an orthopedic surgeon named Parvis Cambin. And Dr. Cambin practiced at a hospital in Pittsburgh. Um, and he developed this particular technique of going through the hole that's already there. Shot. He taught a few surgeons back in the 80s, 90s. One of those surgeons taught me this, this technique. And some of them were actually from Korea. So they traveled, give me an AP, from Korea, South Korea specifically, not North Korea, but South Korea. They traveled from South Korea to the United States, learned the technique from Dr. Kambin. Now the surgeon that taught me this transforaminal approach the most is now retired, but um, I was fortunate enough to meet him and train with him. Over the course of a few years, I didn't train for a few years in his facility, but over the course of a few years, I had opportunities to go to Phoenix, Arizona, where he had his surgery center and his practice. And I was able to shot. I was able to train with him and learn from him. And he is, in my opinion, the best, was the best endoscopic transforaminal surgeon in the world. Shot. Now, un unfortunately, he d it's Dr. Anthony Young. He did not do what I do. He did a different surgery once he got there. But the, the path to get there, I learned from him. AP, which is what I'm doing right now. <coughs> and he learned it from Dr. Camden and modified it, by the way. So every time another great surgeon comes along and learns the technique, they change it and they modify it and they make it better. And so I learned from Dr. Anthony Young over in Phoenix, and he, he's done over 10,000 of these surgeries, lumbar. He never did cervical or thoracic. Those are, I've done cervical and thoracic, so I added those, and I'm the first in the United States to do the cervical, and I'm the first in the world to do thoracic transferaminal. Are you okay? Shot? You doing all right? Where do you feel that? Your back? All right. Well, you're doing fantastic, by the way. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, there's an improvement already. So this funny thing happens. Anytime the blood pressure goes up, people start to bleed <laughs> when they have a surgical incision. I can't explain it. <laughs> Shot. All right. Hopefully we can get all three of your discs from one place. Give me some num num. So right now we're passing through the skin and the fascia. So if I were to describe to you the layers, it would be skin it would be subcutaneous tissues like fat, loose areolar tissue, and then you have the fascia of the lumbar muscles. And then you got the muscles, and then you got the foramen, because literally you pop out of the muscle and you're in the foramen. That's the beauty of the surgery. There's no damage to the spine at all. Shot, so right on the facet joint. I'm gonna back up just a little and try to redirect around the facet, shot. And I wanna go lateral to the facet. And part of the problem is this patient does have shot some facet disease. Facet disease means enlargement of the facet joint, shot. And the reason it's enlarged is arthritis. That's the long and short of it. So long-standing shot arthritis can definitely cause facet disease, shot. I'm very close to being where we need to be, shot. And you can see right now I'm targeting the L3-4 shot. So I'm just going to sneak right into the foramen, nice and g gentle. And remember, the nerve root's coming out of this foramen, but it comes out at the top half. So I want to stay in the bottom half. 
All right, AP, I'm gonna check my AP view, make sure I'm where I wanna be on the front back view because I'm just using the side view right now. And again, you can see the PARS defect at L4. That's why he's got a grade one list thesis. But we're not fixing the PARS defect. We're still gonna fix his problem though. You don't need to fix a PARS defect. You don't need to fuse. That's what a lot of surgeons have been taught. You certainly can't do a laminectomy. If you're gonna do a laminectomy, you need to do a fusion. But we're not doing a laminectomy. We're doing a Duke laser disc repair. Nice. So we're literally inside his herniation right now. Perfect. So we got lucky. We got all three discs with one incision. Show them, show the audience the incision here. Can you do that? Yep. You all see that incision? So we're gonna, we're doing three disc repairs through one incision. And let me show you something. Is he awake? Okay. The other surgeon, just lay still, you're doing great. We're almost done. We're almost done. Just lay still. I'm just doing a little teaching here and you're gonna get to watch this and learn. So before I was an endoscopic transferaminal surgeon, I was a open spine surgeon, a top, a top fusion surgeon probably in, in the world with my results being as good as they were. And I can tell you if I was doing a fusion surgery and I've done a thousand of these lumbar fusions, the incision would be, would be like this from here to here to fix three discs, okay? So the bottom disc is the L5-S1 disc. It's right here. Then there's an L4-5 disc here, and then there's an L3-4 disc here, okay? The reason the incision is so long is that you have to put screws in, and the screws go into the pedicles, and they're called pedicle screws. So you actually have to put in eight pedicle screws for this type of effusion, and then a rod, the rod to connect everything, okay? And let me tell you something, I'm really good at the surgery in terms of complications, not having them, plus not doing damage to muscles and stuff. But imagine you have to peel the muscles off the spine and retract them over far enough to get the rods in. And those rods are pretty lateral. So your muscles are literally out here and they're being retracted for three hours. So this surgery we're doing today, look at the difference. Seven millimeter incision, no fusion, no metal. It's just repairing the disc. That's why I've converted all my patients and my practice essentially to endoscopic surgery. Because it works. All right, any questions from our audience? No current questions. All right, we're gonna start our, our uh, diagnostics now. Let's go ahead and run a quick video. Uh, actually, let's go ahead and do this uh, first and then we'll run the video afterwards, okay? Okay. All right, you doing all right? Are patients awake? How long have you had back pain in your life? Back pain. How long? When did it start? How many years ago? College, but I mean, we don't know when you went to college. So just give me a number of years. Five years, 10 years, 20 years. Okay, four years. Four years. Yeah. Four. Four years? Yeah. Oh, okay. So your back pain started four years ago. Yes, sir. All right. And then when did your left leg pain start? Uh, you were lifting something, right? Uh, relatively recently, and really no. I just do in and out of the car. It's a whole shit. Getting in and out of the car, you just move some boxes around. How long ago was that? Two months. Two months ago? Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. All right. So chronic back pain, four years dealing with it. And of course, that's due to the annular tear, which happens in the back of the disc. There's a tear that forms at these three discs. And then of course, lifting things forces the jelly from the center out through the tear. And then you get this herniation, which starts pushing on the nerves. That's why he got the leg pain. But the back pain was from the tear itself. And we're gonna fix the tears today as well. Not just, not just remove the herniation, hitting the nerve, going down his leg, but we're gonna repair the tears. Are you comfy? Yes. All right. You know what happens next? Uh, huh? Yeah. How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? 10 being the worst pain. Ten. All right. Is that where you get back pain typically? Yes, sir. So we got a 10 out of 10 concordant. Yeah. You're okay? 
We had to test that disc. You're a strong man. So the good news is that pain will be gone for the rest of your life. Nice. Won't that be nice? Yes, sir. And he said it himself, nice. Do you know you have green blood? No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Actually, it's blue. It's a mixture of red and, and uh, blue, so it's green. <laughs> it's the dye we use. It's the Duke Spine dye. All right. You comfy? Yes, sir. All right. Oh. I'm sorry. How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? 10. Is that where you typically get your back pain? Uh, yes, sir. All right. So that was, those are two discs that we tested, the L5S1 and the L45. And we're going to be able to put you to sleep in just a couple of minutes here. When I put you to sleep, I want you to count out loud from 1 to 100. Okay. All right? What languages do you speak? How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? 10. All right. Is that where you typically get your back pain? Yes. Great. That'll be gone when you wake up. What do you want to do first? Five. Count from 1 to 100 for me. Yes. Go ahead. This time now, you're going to go to sleep. When you wake up, we'll be done with your surgery. Okay. Great job, by the way. Everything's going well. Nice and loud. I want you to count in Dutch for me, okay? Yes. Uh, it sounds like Dutch. <laughs> no, count in Korean. In honor of your wife. Do you know how to count in Korean? All right, he's asleep. So he, he took the, the path of least resistance out, right? <laughs> No, I don't know how to count green. I'm going to go to sleep now. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Berndez. All right, so we are, um, we've tested three discs with our discogram, and all three are causing 10 out of 10 pain that's concordant. So we know we found the source of his back pain. We just confirmed that. And then, of course, based on the MRI physical exam, we can see that this is also what's causing his left leg pain because I could see the herniations hitting the nerve. You can actually see the herniations. Why don't you show them the herniation right now? Go to the x-ray picture that we just did. And can you guys see the white arrow? Yeah. You can see it. Henry, you see it? Yes. All right. Uh, Jordan is outlining the herniation. You can see the tear. Show them where the tear starts, the annular tear. A little more to the right. Right there. That's where the tear starts. And you can see that's where the tear starts. And all the black stuff is the dye attached to the herniation going out. So you can see the herniation going out. And it's going right up against the nerve. Show them where the nerve is, right in there. That's correct. All right, good. Very good. So um, let's go ahead and get started at L5S1. Can you move your fluoro south half an inch to an inch? Now, this patient was fortunate enough to find us at Duke Spine. But had he not found us, his only other surgery that I think would give him any good relief would be a major fusion surgery. Screws and rods. Shot? All right, looks good. Um, so <clears throat> to avoid a major fusion, he came here for endoscopic surgery. They knew exactly what they wanted. And that's my favorite patient, by the way, someone who's researched, because we have over uh, 2,500 videos right now online on YouTube, Facebook, where you can actually watch these surgeries, all the surgeries that we do. And we've been broadcasting these surgeries live for now for nine years. And you can watch every single one of them beginning to end, unedited. Um, and the purpose of that is so that people can learn what it is we do in surgery and they could see the, the surgery done and they could understand it. Let's go ahead and run our video animation showing why do people get back pain from a herniated disc. Traumatic injury to the disc can cause annular tears to form. Pressure on the disc causes herniation of the nucleus pulpus through the annular tear. 
Inflammatory tissues develop within the annular tear, causing back pain. The inflamed annular tear generates pain signals. Additional injuries can cause symptoms to worsen. Inflammation from the annular tear can spread to nearby nerve roots, causing leg pain. Signals travel up nerves to the brain, causing localized back pain. Pain signals reach the primary somatosensory cortex, causing conscious awareness of pain. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, Submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. All right, so we're inserting the tube that we're gonna do the entire surgery through into the L5S1 space. And once we get this tube in position, we'll get started with our first Duke laser disc repair at L5S1. You want me to wait? All right. We're just getting the patient situated. Now, a lot of people complain about the hammering um, in the videos. They say, why do you need to hammer? The truth is, is that hammering actually allows me to deliver just the right amount of energy. Shot, I think that we've got a cold fusion. And I think they're fused together shot so we're gonna have to try to get the middle thing out because a little bit of disc material has gotten between the tube and the dilator and it's kind of got them stuck together but I've got my secret weapon Luis yeah. shot and uh, yeah. yeah it looks good yeah. so thank you Luis Luis comes in riding on the horse, saving the day like a Canadian Mountie. You know what I'm talking about, right? Have you been to Universal? Yeah, yeah. You know that water ride, with the raft ride where the Bullwinkle, Rocky and Bullwinkle? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the Canadian Mounties. They're famous for riding in and saving the day. Or it could be high ho silver and at Universal. Yeah, it's a water ride. It's like a it's a really good ride actually. Oh yeah. yeah. If you're if you're really hot, you go there and you get on that ride, it'll cool you off. There's some good water rides at Universal. It's one of the nice things about living so close to Orlando. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and show our audience what we're doing here with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. Let's run the animation that explains what we're doing to fix this patient's herniated disc and annular tear to get rid of their back pain. Disc herniations are a common cause of chronic back pain. The inflamed annular tear causes back pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes leg pain. A band-aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. All right, welcome back. 
We've just had you watch our video animation explaining how the Duke Laser Disc Repair works. Basically, everything starts with an annular tear or a tear in the wall of the disc, and that's where the herniations come out. And this right here is a herniation, the blue thing you're seeing, that I'm using the laser to vaporize. Now, how do lasers work? They basically deliver very powerful energy, but precise, very precise, far more precise than any surgical instrument. As a matter of fact, this fiber is a one millimeter fiber, side to side. Sometimes we'll use a half a millimeter fiber, for example, in the cervical disc. Delivery of energy through that one millimeter or half millimeter wide fiber, you imagine is very precise because it can only be delivered through the end of a fiber that's half a millimeter or a millimeter. So think about a millimeter as just the space between your fingers enough to see light if you're holding your fingers apart the tips of your fingers, all right? So this is a very precise instrument. And it's not that it's misunderstood by other doctors, it's that it's, um, they don't know how to use it. And because they don't know how to use it, they, they bag it. They uh, try to knock it, they try to say bad things about laser spine surgery. But the truth is, is that I'm a very experienced surgeon in fusions and open surgery, lasers, microdiscectomy, endoscopic. I do it all, artificial disc. The point is, this is the most precise tool I've ever used as a neurosurgeon. And lasers are being used more and more in neurosurgery. They're being used to remove brain tumors. They're being used to release um, nerves in patients with conditions like cystic fibrosis. Sorry. Um, Cerebral palsy, I apologize, not cystic fibrosis, cerebral palsy. I'm just focused on this herniation right here. And they're used, lasers are used in urology, which is kidney surgery and uh, prostate surgery. They're used in gynecological procedures and orthopedic procedures like meniscal repairs, shoulder uh, repairs for the torn rotator cuffs and debridements. So my point is lasers are used all throughout medicine and they're very safe. There's no laser complications unless you're dealing with a, like a CO2 laser, which we don't use. Um, some lasers are riskier than others, and the older, cheaper CO2 lasers are an example. Uh, they can actually cause, for example, gases to you know, ignite. Uh, but these homium YAG lasers that we use are the safest, but they're also the most expensive. So, you know, Unfortunately, um, some hospitals don't want to spend the money on the high quality laser and they're going to buy a cheap laser and you know, that's when sometimes complications can happen. I've been using this laser now for 16 years with zero complications, not just from the laser, but zero complications from the surgery. We've never had a CSF leak or a nerve damage. We've never had uh, infection from our surgery. Um, so the laser surgery is extremely safe when it's done endoscopically. Now using the laser without the endoscope may be a different situation. You can't really see as well what you're doing, but as long as you're doing it endoscopically, it should be fine. All right, what we're seeing here is a little bit of epidural fat. This is all part of the herniation here at L5-S1 on the left side. You can see the end plate of L5 right there. Do we send that scope off from Tuesday? I mean, from last uh, week? Thursday, yes, Thursday. Yeah. yeah, it was definitely a lens problem, right? Yeah. What do you think about that company we're using? You like them? I like them. They're fast, actually. Fast? They're fast and cheap. And does their work last, though? Uh, yeah. Does the work last? Yeah. yeah. Are we still using 30 milliliters of the local? Three. Huh? Three? Sorry, three. 30%. I apologize, 30%. So we are using it? Yes, we are. Uh, Dr. Berndez, you think that that's enough? Should we use more? I think three or four is perfect. Seems like it's I'm getting uh, less, uh, less strong. 
You're doing fine. Lay still. Just tell me when I can proceed. Look at that. It's a bit calcified right there. So that's part of the herniation, and it's, it's got a bone spur. Let me know when I can proceed. Lay still. You're fine. All right, so I'm going to... While we're getting his, uh, him a little deeper asleep, I'm going to go in with the grabber and try to see how much. There's a piece of the herniation right there. So the surgery really does require both the grabbers and the uh, laser. It's not one or the other. It's essential to do both. The laser fiber cannot remove big herniations. It can only release the herniated fragments that are scarred to the annulus. Let me know when I can proceed with the laser. Everything going okay? Good. Remember, at the 12 o'clock position you're seeing is what we call medial. It's where the, um, all the nerve roots are. It's all protected by the, of course, by the uh, tube laser. Now let's see how the laser handles that bone spur. Come on, you got to get that right. It's not that hard, guys. People wonder what the laser can do for a bone spur. Well, there's your answer. There's what we call no contesto. Another calcification there. We have a question from YouTube. Sure. This comes out to, uh, from Dalton Groff. And they Hello, Dalton. And they ask, how does the patient not be in pain? How does the patient not be in pain? Well, the patient's already in pain to begin with before their surgery. Otherwise, they wouldn't be having surgery. So the way you get out of pain is by having the surgery. Um, so hopefully that's obvious to you. But during the surgery, how are they not in pain? What we're doing is we're doing a uh, anesthesia. And I don't want to move the camera around the room, but at the head of the bed, right up here, there's an anesthesiologist who's, who has this patient asleep. And the way we have the patient asleep is with a substance called propofol. It's a, an elixir of medication that basically is delivered through the vein, and it's very effective at putting people to sleep. But um, it's also great because when the levels of propofol go down in the bloodstream, the patients wake up very quickly, which is what we want. We want our patients to recover quickly. So it's, uh, the only issue is you got to titrate it and every patient burns through it differently. So basically, um, some patients, they, they burn it up and they get subtherapeutic quick. Other patients, it stays in their system and has a therapeutic effect longer. So every patient's different, and we don't know patient to patient how they're gonna behave with a propofol until we start the surgery. So that's why the anesthesiologist just has to monitor everything, their breathing, their airway, their circulation, we got to make sure their vitals are stable because too much propofol and the patient will stop breathing. And that's bad. So how do they stay out of pain? Through the anesthetic propofol that we use for this particular surgery. And the anesthesiologist is here just titrating it the whole time, just trying to get it perfect, the right levels. Pardon me? It all depends on the triad, how, how you dose it and how they do with the surgery. The triad is smoking history, drinking history, and 
Yeah. So uh, Dr. Berndez is just saying that there are things that patients can do that affect how effective the propofol is. One of them is smoking. Um, and another one is drinking alcohol, and another one is uh, other medications they're using. All right, for example, marijuana. Uh, some people use THC to treat pain, and what that does, unfortunately, is it, it makes the propofol um, sedation more ch tricky, more challenging, right? It causes delirium. It causes delirium. So, Delirium is basically a state of confusion. And we don't want that, obviously, but um, we can't control what people do, you know, before they come here. We can only forewarn them. I don't think that's the case with this patient, of course. We don't expect any, anything, um, alcohol, drugs, smoking. This is a very healthy, clean patient, but just in general, the effects of propofol on patient to patient are determined in part by their alcohol consumption history, smoking history, and additional um, medications or drugs that they use. So it's really, uh, it's kind of tricky because you never know what you're gonna get. Every patient is this, you know, situation where, okay, um, how is their anesthesia gonna go? You know, we don't know. Uh, we can do our best to predict it based on their weight, their size, their history. But um, in the end, it's, it's kind of like taking a boat out on the ocean, right? You never know, are the waves gonna be one foot tall, two feet tall, three feet tall? You know, when you get out there, you have no way of knowing for sure. Uh, it depends on the wind, depends on the currents, it depends on whether there's a storm system nearby, and it depends on the topography of the bottom of the ocean in that area. I mean, there's so many variables, whether there's a coral reef. So, you know, there's a lot of factors that affect the ability of us to provide uh, a sleeping state that's safe. But in the end, it's a balancing act between being asleep and being awake. And if you're too asleep, well, you're gonna stop breathing and get asphyxiated and then that could be serious. You could die from that. So we need to, balance the depth of the anesthesia with safety and breathing of the patient. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we also use uh, local anesthetic. If you remember in the beginning, if you don't, rewind and see, but I injected the patient with some numbing medicine. So that way the need for anesthetic is reduced. So it's really a complex dance between the multiple factors, but I try to give as much local sedation as I can, or local anesthetic as I can. It's really analgesic. And uh, that helps the anesthesiologist basically use less medicine. Stand by laser. Yeah. So great question. I hope we were able to answer it for you in a way you understand. It's kind of a mess here. This is where most of the herniation was and we've debulked it. You're never gonna get 100% of herniation out no matter what surgery you do. So it's really a matter of getting as much as you can get out safely. Um, and that's what we're doing. And I keep working medially. You can see little pieces of herniation coming out. This is all calcified here. So not only did this patient have a herniated disc, but it's been becoming calcified. So basically it's uh, not good. I mean, it's severe. It's more than just a soft disc herniation, it's a hard, hard disc herniation and people ask me all the time, does the laser work for bone spurs? Absolutely. Here's a prime example. This has been, this, this area here I can tell has been herniated for a long time, years. 
you don't get this kind of calcification of a disc herniation overnight. This takes years and years and years to develop. So his symptoms may have started four years ago, but his injury is far older than that. He must have injured this probably 40 years ago to have this much calcium. Great questions. Keep the questions coming. We love questions. We're here to teach, answer questions for people. All right, just about done. That's going to be the last of it right there, and then we're going to move on to L45. We have uh, two follow-up questions. Two follow-up questions, sure. Yeah. Uh, the first one is from Reiko Pilot on YouTube. Hi there. And they asked, are there recommended techniques slash medications for pain relief to help a herniated patient cope until they are, on, until they are able to have surgery? And are they different for uh, different areas of the spine? Yeah. Great question. Thank you so much for asking. So are there techniques, pain techniques that can be used? Um, the answer is absolutely. You know, the surgery is the definitive treatment. There's nothing else that works permanently but the surgery whether it's the DLDR, what we're doing today, which is the best, or fusion. Um, but there is something called an epidural steroid injection where we can actually inject uh, anti-inflammatory medicine around the disc, and that usually will help with the uh, pain and uh, back pain and leg symptoms, or if it's in your neck, neck pain and arm symptoms, maybe even headaches. So epidural steroid injections are good, but they're just temporary. That's the problem. And um, anti-inflammatory medication. The problem with anti-inflammatory medicine is that it will destroy your kidneys. It will destroy your stomach and give you an ulcer for sure uh, if you keep taking it every day. So. We don't recommend that. It also increases your stroke risk and heart attack risk, risk of getting a stroke and heart attack, which we don't recommend people because typically the people who have spine problems are older, so they're at higher risk for stroke and heart attack. So the best thing to do is get this surgery you're watching right now and get it fixed. All right. So we've, we've taken the tube out of L5S1, and I'm just applying a little bit of pressure to the paraspinous muscles that we went through. Good. Now we're gonna get our fluoroscope, our x-ray machine back in so we can use that to navigate to the next disc, which is L45. Remember, I need that x-ray machine to guide me to place the tube in to the disc through the tear. Now, one of the, you put pressure here. One of the nice things about um, this technique, folks, is we are entering the disc, guess where? Through the tear, through the herniation. So we're actually not causing any new damage to the disc, okay? One of the biggest problems with traditional spine surgery, microdiscectomy, laminectomy, fusion, artificial disc, is that all those surgeries create damage to normal structures. I mean normal structures in your spine. Remember, your spinal column is supposed to be a structurally sound um, organ of your body. It supports your entire body, your head, your shoulders, your arms, your organs. And when you start to take parts of it out to do a spine surgery, which is what all the other surgeries require you to do, like laminectomy, microdiscectomy, ACDF, you're removing parts of the spine in order to try to fix a herniated disc. Well, that's gonna weaken the spine and cause more problems. So that's the beauty of this surgery is we're not weakening the spine by removing ligaments or bone. We're actually going through a hole that's already there and we're entering the disc through the tear. Hold this. And the tear is where the herniation is. So that's what's wonderful about this surgery is we're literally pushing the herniation back in 
as we're putting this tube in and dilator in. So then I just fish the herniated fragments out of the disc. And that technique is called the inside out technique. And that's one of the techniques that Dr. Young taught me, Anthony Young, my mentor. He taught me the inside out technique. And he's always been a proponent of the inside out technique rather than the outside in technique where you start in the foramen. It's much safer to do inside out. Sean? There are some surgeons that will go outside in. I do not recommend it. I do not do it. It's more dangerous and less helpful. All right, so we got our tube in to the L45 and we're gonna fix that one next. We've already repaired 5.1. Now we're gonna debride the annular tear at 4.5. Remember, all three of these discs were 10 out of 10 pain when we tested them just 15, 20 minutes ago at the beginning of the surgery. Okay, for those of you who've never seen it, this is the endoscope. Henry, you wanna show them the endoscope? Lights on, please. Yes, sir. Light on, can you see this? Yep. So you have a shaft, which is a rod lens configuration, and there's a little port there that um, allows me to work through it. Plus you have a light source, you have a irrigation port, and you have a camera port, like a lens. And then you have a camera here that picks up the image from the lens, a light source, irrigation. And then I work through this channel here. Everything we do in this surgery is 100% FDA approved. Lights off, please. Thank you. This is an FDA approved surgery. It's been peer reviewed and published multiple times. I presented this surgery through the peer review process at the American Association of Neurological Surgeons meeting, the uh, Congress of Neurological Surgeons meeting as an invited speaker to speak on it and the results. Also Becker Spine Review and the Society uh, for the Advancement of Minimally Invasive Spine Surgery. And of course, more recently in Los Angeles at the uh, Brain Mapping and Therapeutics meeting just this year, I think it was in January, I presented as well thoracic and cervical duke laser disc repair. So anyway, um, our, my procedure duke laser disc repair is now included in textbooks for endoscopic spine surgery. And again, the most unique thing that I do is an annular debridement, which you're watching right now. It's done with a laser. I'm the first person to do it, first person to publish it and describe it medically and it is the key to getting rid of back pain and leg pain. Because it gets rid of the source of inflammation. Let's run our video one more time on how the Duke Laser Disc Repair actually works. Disc herniations are a common cause of chronic back pain. The inflamed annular tear causes back pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes leg pain. A band-aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. Welcome back. We were just chatting about a Netflix show. If you're a Netflix subscriber, 
we were talking about a show that I've just started watching myself called uh, Love, Death, and Robots. It's uh, apparently in the third season. Started first season in 2019. But it's all animation. And um, animation really started getting popular many years ago with, uh, with the Japanese and something called Japanimation. And that was back in the 80s. 70s, 80s, but animation has become more and more popular, and it kind of has died off a little bit over the last 10, 15 years. Hasn't really become as popular in the United States, but this show is all animation, and it's different studios producing uh, short animation um, stories that are a bit weird, you know, dealing with uh, robots and monsters and things like that, but it's it's fun, and um, the animation is incredible. Some of the animators have done such a good job with the animation of the characters, and uh, it, it looks real. I mean, you can, if, if you don't have a good TV, you might actually believe that it's real characters, <laughs> right? Henry? Oh, You've seen it? Oh, yeah, and uh, with all the characters, uh, it, uh, they do live act, uh, action, motion yeah. capture, you name it, they knock it out of the park with all that. So uh, if you have a chance on uh, Netflix, check it out. It's a good series. Um, I wonder how many of those animation sequences use the, the new Unreal Engine, you know, to develop their animations. They used it from the start. Huh? They used it from the start. They do? Yeah. So it's, they're using the Unreal Engine? Mm-hmm. Correct. That's awesome. For those of you who don't know what the Unreal Engine is, um, if you're a first-person shooter gamer from the 80s, you'll know that Unreal was a video game released where basically you're in an alien world and you have to fight off the aliens and discover things. Well, the engine that was used to create the characters has been improved on over the years to the point now that everything looks almost real. And the main things they work on are things like shadowing to make the characters or objects look real. And um, physics, which is how things move in the environment. You know, do they look like a real human walking? the way the body moves, do the animals move, do they look real? Is it convincing? So there are improvements over the years with the animation to make them much more real looking. And the Unreal Engine is probably the most popular, I think, commercially available um, program platform for developing characters and sequences. And it's carried from the 80s all the way to the year, what, 2022. And we have a question from YouTube. Sure. And it uh, comes back from Dalton Groff. And uh, from your answer uh, that you asked before, he uh, asked, uh, does nicotine slow down the fusion or make the bones more brittle? Yeah, great question. So one of our viewers is asking about nicotine and how it um, affects the outcomes of spine surgery or bones in general. The answer is nicotine is a naturally found compound, obviously, and we, we get it mostly through chewing tobacco, vaping, or cigarette smoking. Nicotine um, binds to receptors in the body that are natural. We have them already. They're called nicotinic adrenergic receptors. And it, it has a, basically an effect, a, a pharmacological effect. So what does it have to do with spine surgery? Well, nicotine is a powerful vasoconstrictor. It causes narrowing of the blood vessels when it binds to those receptors. And um, 
by narrowing the blood vessels, you get less circulation to, to tissues. And specifically after spine surgery like fusion, your bones, um, in a fusion surgery, the surgeon doesn't really fuse the bones. They basically scrape the bones. We call it decortication. And they want the bones then to grow together after scraping them up. They're, they're, they really are causing what are called micro fractures on the surface of the bones. And then they want those bones to go, grow together. So the nicotine basically uh, blocks the healing of the bones by restricting blood flow. Healing in the human body requires a blood supply. That's why these discs don't heal quickly. They heal very slowly because they don't have much blood supply. So if you are trying to fuse somebody's spine as a doctor um, and the patient is using nicotine, they're basically gonna be working against the end game or the end goal, which is to get the bones to fuse because it's reducing blood flow and circulation to the area that needs to fuse. That's the problem with nicotine. Now, does it cause brittle bones? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think it does. I'm not aware of that. Uh, if that's new research, I'm not aware of it. But it definitely impairs healing. And yeah, and it speeds up osteoporosis, which is weak bones. Dr. Berndez, our anesthesiologist, is adding that the nicotine stimulates the liver to basically break down things quicker, um, things that you may want in your body to help you heal from surgery. So in general, we don't recommend nicotine use at all. Now, if you are a smoker, you're having surgery, we don't want you to quit smoking if you're quitting within two days of your surgery because you're just gonna end up coughing a lot, getting a lot of secretions, and that's gonna potentially cause some complications in the airway. So if you're gonna have surgery, you wanna quit at least a week before surgery so that your airway can heal and your um, mucociliary escalator can start working properly and clear all the secretions out. Huh? What levels? Yeah, carboxyhemoglobin levels go back to normal. So, good point. How long does that take, Dr. Berndes? 15 days? 14 days. So, if you're going to quit smoking for surgery, do it two weeks before your surgery at a minimum. Of course, it's best just to quit smoking altogether. Right? All right, we're almost done at L45. A lot of scar tissue here, again, all this stuff related, related to the herniation. You're doing great. Let's have a grabber. Standby laser. So, we're almost done with the second disc. And you can see all the chronic inflammation in here. It's pretty impressive, actually. There's a lot of uh, vascularization of the tissue from chronic inflammation right there. You can see it. Grabber. How's he doing? <clears throat> All right, so this should be it right here. Um, just clean up the last bit. You can see the epidural fat at 12 o'clock. We know we're basically done. There's a little vascularity of the tissue because of the chronic inflammation. Remember, chronic inflammation causes a granulation tissue. Granulation tissue is vascular and it has little nerve fibers in it that are um, what we call unmyelinated nerve fibers. So that's not good. Unmyelinated nerve fibers are pain fibers. 
So basically you're gonna be feeling a lot of pain with all this granulation tissue here. And that's why these herniated discs cause pain. It's really the inflammatory tissues associated with the annular tear that are the pain source of the back pain. And that's what we're here to fix. All right, looks good. Laser off, let me just take one more look. To get a good look when you have a little bit of bleeding, you put in your grabber. Look at the detail, the anatomical detail. You can see a little vein there running along the back of the posterior longitudinal ligament or foraminal ligament. And you got a little fat. See all each of those little glistening areas is a fat cell, one fat cell. So the, uh, the, the magnification is quite amazing of what we've got here. All right, I'm pretty happy with that. Let me just see, hold on. Just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. All right, that should be good. Okay. Good. Suck all the juice out. Scope off, please. Thank you. Scope off. A little antiseptic. We use betadine as our antiseptic to topically cleanse the wound. Betadine was developed by NASA as a topical antiseptic. Topical meaning you don't inject it in the veins or muscles. You uh, just kind of dump it on top of the wound. It's called topical. And uh, the betadine is a very effective antiseptic for bacteria. Um, I think viruses and even fungus and protozoans. Lay still. You're doing great. Yeah, you're doing great. Just lay still, we're almost done. So we've got one more disc to do. And that's, that's the uh, L34. We've already done five one, the hardest. We've done four five, the second hardest. And now three four, I'm not saying it's gonna be easy. Three four is in terms of getting to it is probably easier than four five and five one, but um, three, four has a huge herniation in the foramen, so. How's he doing? So we're using Marcane and, Marcane and Lidocaine. Luis, yes, sir. Marcane and Lidocaine. In the uh, disc injection? Yes. So we're getting ready to start our last disc. Remember, we've done a discogram at each disc. Shot. And go ahead and put pressure. And we know that all three of these discs are causing 10 out of 10 pain for him. So we need to fix all three. How are we doing, guys? But you want me to wait? Okay, no problem. Yeah. All right, so we're just going to hang on a minute. Any questions from our audience? No current questions. So some of you may be wondering, why are you doing this surgery? The answer is to get rid of back pain and get rid of leg pain. What is the leg pain called? You may all know it as sciatica. Sciatic pain is pain shooting down the leg from a pinched nerve or irritated nerve, usually from a herniated disc, right where these herniations are. So our goal is to cure the back pain from the discs, cure the leg symptoms from the herniation. 
The leg symptoms, there's four of them. Pain down the leg, which is known as sciatica. Okay. Numbness, tingling, weakness. So whenever you have a pinched nerve, root at the neural foramen level, you can get pain down the leg, numbness, tingling, weakness. And the pain is really, it's really due to inflammation. It's not due to a pinched nerve. Everyone thinks pinched nerves cause pain down the leg. It's actually inflammation primarily that causes the leg pain. The pinching of the nerve, a compression of the nerve causes weakness, numbness, and tingling. Sean? All right, so we're gonna enter this L34 disc right where the tear is. You can see I'm going into the tear and this dilator is going in quite easily through the tear. It's a big tear. I even took the herniation with me into the disc, so most of it. So I just took a lot of it from, remember, we're literally entering the disc through the herniation. So I'm shoving the herniation back in. That's great because it, A, it reduces the herniation into the disc where it's safer to remove, but also B, it uh, helps decompress the nerve root right away. Shot? Uh, all right, so I'm gonna have to pull it back out a little bit because the dilator is wanting to go in further. Shot, is that where we are? Yes, sir. Okay, so I wanna pull the dilator back a little. Shot? Let's try again. Let me have a ray tech. Shot. Looks better. Shot. Shot. All right, that should be good. Thank you, Luis. Looks perfect. Last disc, the L34 on the left side. Once again, this patient only had left leg findings. That's why we're going on the left side. If he had nerve problems on the right side, we'd be going on the right side as well. But the side that we go on is determined by the leg symptoms or the side of the disc herniation, basically. Now he does have a herniated disc on the right side. I saw it on his MRI, but he doesn't have any right leg weakness, numbness, or tingling. And he has no right leg pain. So um, it's, if anything, it's very minimal. And by doing the Duke laser disc repair on the left side, sometimes those herniations will retract a little bit enough to get rid of any right leg symptoms. So, that's what they call the art of medicine. How's he doing? Great. Patient's doing well. Um, so we got this last disc. You can already see a lot of scar tissue in the tear with the herniation here. Laser's doing a great job of vaporizing, ablating. All right, any questions from our audience? Yes, we have a question from uh, on YouTube and goes uh, name of Sherry Hope. Hello, Sherry. And they asked, uh, I have uh, sciatica, but my doctor did two epidurals on my back, and now he says I need surgery. What should I do? Should I trust this doctor that diagnos diagnosed me wrong? Um, well, Sherry, uh, let me just repeat what I, I hear. So you have sciatica, you've had two epidurals, and now they're saying surgery. Um, I think that what, what I'm hearing so far is pretty normal treatment. Somebody with sciatica, they want to do an epidural. Epidurals are good for two reasons. One, they reduce symptoms right away without surgery. 
so you can actually put the surgery off for a little while. But number two, they also tell us for sure that your problem is inflammatory, right? Because all the epidural does is it's reducing inflammation down there. So um, if I were you, I would have this procedure done, the Duke laser disc repair. Your surgeon won't know how to do this. The only thing, I think your surgeon is correct that you need surgery, but I think the type of surgery they're gonna offer you is an older surgery, because that's all they know. This is a newer type of surgery, endoscopic Duke laser disc repair, um, unless your surgeon knows how to do the endoscopic Duke laser disc repair. So the problem is the surgery they're gonna offer you is a microdiscectomy or a laminectomy, which is bad. They're gonna be drilling holes in your spine, in the bone where there's normal bone. They're gonna be taking out normal ligaments. You don't want normal bone and ligament removed from your spine. And the reason they're doing that is so they can get down to where the disc herniation is. And trust me, I did hundreds of these surgeries and it's so damaging to your body that I don't understand why surgeons have, haven't abandoned it, those techniques. Um, if they offer you fusion, that's overkill. If they offer you an artificial disc, it's overkill. An artificial disc I don't like because they don't really work. I mean, that's the God's honest truth. If they did, I would do them. Um, so really the best you could do is this endoscopic transferiminal surgery that we're doing here. So if, if you want, come down here or send your MRI in. Why don't you put a link on there? Um, Henry, so that people can see the uh, MRI review. And you can get a free virtual MRI review. It costs you nothing. You get an MRI review and consultation. It's free. Just uh, send your MRI and upload it to mri.dukespine.com. By the way, that link was broken. We just got it fixed last night. I was using the mri.dukespine.com link for a long time, and we started to get some people saying, when I click on the link, there's just Chinese writing. <laughs> and I thought at first uh, they must have you know, clicked on the wrong thing or something. But no, it's true. Somebody had hijacked our, our link and was uh, advertising something in something Chinese. I don't know what it was. I can't read Chinese. But point is, is the link should be working now. So mri.dukespine.com. Send us your MRI. We'll give you our honest opinion. But this is the way to go. This surgery, seven millimeter, quarter inch incision, outpatient, literally go home an hour after your surgery. So I agree with your surgeon, you need surgery most likely, but the only way I know that for sure is to see your MRI and do a quick interview with you, which is all free and done virtually. Come on, you cannot pull it off like that should be common sense. You have to lift it off properly. We have another question from Reiko Pilot on YouTube. All right. And they asked, how and or why do herniated discs occur through wear, wear and tear? Okay, Is I heard the first half. How and why to herniate the disc, and then you you just blended everything. Yeah, my bad, my bad. How and or why do herniated discs occur through wear and tear? Is it usually the first injury in a kinetic chain, or more often the result of a, a compensatory activity from injury elsewhere? Yeah, great question. Thank you for asking. A frequent question people ask is why why did I get a herniated disc? Is it a repetitive injury or what's going on. That's why we developed the video to explain it. It's literally the same for everybody. A herniated disc starts with the tear in the annulus. That right there where I'm touching right now is the tear. As you can see the frayed ends of the annulus literally ripped apart. And then the blue stuff is the nuclear material that squeezes out through the tear like jelly through a jelly donut through a hole. And and then, of course, it, it causes inflammation. How's my irrigation? Because it looks like we're about out. Yeah, we got to pay attention to that. Um, anyway, 
We're just about done. Uh, three minutes. So what I'd like to do, rather than try to explain it, is um, show you a video. And um, do you mind running that? Actually, yeah, five minutes. Do you mind running that video? Which that shows how a herniated disc happens. It starts with a traumatic tear of the annulus. And then oh, through bending and lifting and twisting, you squeeze jelly out through the tear. And that's what I'm cleaning right now. I'm cleaning the jelly that is squeezed out through the tear. Most of it's blue, some of it's white, but this is where the tear is. And I went through the tear to fix this patient's herniation. Yeah, five minutes I think is about accurate. Go ahead and give us a countdown. Disc herniations are a common cause of chronic back pain. The inflamed annular tear causes back pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes leg pain. A Band-Aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. Okay, hopefully you were able to see the animation and understand how herniations form and why they cause pain. So they form because of a tear within the wall of the disc, the outer wall, called the annulus fibrosis. Once that tear is formed through trauma, through some injury, then um, what happens is the jelly in the center of the disc pushes through that tear, trying to get out. Um, and that usually happens with lifting, bending, twisting. So that's pretty much what we fix. We fix those tears. Um, the tear wants to heal. This is the tear right here, but it cannot heal because the jelly from the center of the disc is stuck in there and it literally prevents it from healing. So, all right, we are literally looking in the foramen right now. This is just below the nerve root. And I wanna make sure we got all the herniation. There's just a little bit right there. Just about done in 30 seconds. So we're going to wrap this up in just a minute. Any more questions from our audience? No current questions. All right, folks, if you have a question, type it up. I'm happy to answer it for you. Um, I'm going to wrap this up in just a minute here, and then I'm going to head over to the conference room. Um, and if you have any more questions, I'm happy to, to try to answer them for you, OK? so. Let's get the laser one more time. Just want to make sure I get all that out because I want anything in there could be pushing on the nerve and I want to make sure we don't have leave anything pushing on that nerve. This is literally the base of the herniation. I've sort of removed it from the base out. It's that inside out technique we talked about earlier.
we just got a question from YouTube if uh, sure yeah. yeah I'll take the question awesome same person from Sherry Hope on YouTube and they ask hey, Sherry and they ask how long does uh, the surgery usually take how long does surgery usually take this surgery typically takes about 20 minutes per disc so if we're fixing three discs it's about an hour um, and of course the patient needs to wake up so another five or ten minutes to wake them up in the operating room and uh, yeah that's about it grab her so it, it's about an hour long surgery and then uh, an hour long recovery and then the patients go home this is outpatient surgery just so you know laser I thought I had 30 seconds, but I just found this one herniation here. What do you got? What are you guys talking about? It's full? Because we're, we're pretty much done here. I just got to zap this, and I think we're done. Doesn't want to suck? A suction canister that doesn't want to suck. God, I love this laser. There's no way to get this stuff out otherwise, you know? You saw me with the grabber, it doesn't work. Okay, we're done. Scope off. Great job, everyone. That was a, a nice case, and I hope he does well. I think he will. We've done everything we can do here. So, Once again, we put a little antiseptic. We're going to be irrigating it out. He's snoozing nicely, nice and comfy. All right, if you have any further questions, feel free to type them up. I'm going to come answer them for you face to face and uh, maybe even use some of my spine model toys so you can visualize what I'm talking about. But let's take a look real quick for everyone to see. Um, can you see this tube? Yeah. So the whole surgery was done through this tube. Fixed three discs, one incision. The incision's about eight millimeters. You know, it's a Band-Aid incision. Take. And he'll literally have a Band-Aid when he leaves the operating room. Will we put a stitch? Yes. We usually put one stitch. Um, and then the stereo strips. I'm going to show you the incision. Just give me a second. But until then, we started with the dilator. Now, how does the dilator work? As it passes through your body, it literally opens the tissues, and when you come out, it closes. So there's no cutting. It doesn't cut anything. It literally spreads it, and then everything comes back together. Where's the tube? Yeah, and the whole surgery was done through this tube right here. In case you didn't get a good look at it. Can you see this here? Yeah. It looks like a straw from McDonald's. You could suck a straight th uh, shake through that thing. But um, it's got a beveled end. And of course, the incision is right here. Tiny, tiny incision, OK? Pressure. And let's get the bandage. Nice job, everybody. Great work. I think he's going to do good. I'll be there to answer your questions, so feel free to type them up. Let's show the audience the other surgery that could have been done to fix this patient's problem, which is the fusion. Let's show them the comparison video, Duke laser disc repair versus fusion. Duke laser disc repair, a comparison with traditional spinal fusion surgery. A patient with chronic back or neck pain originating from a symptomatic disc injury could undergo either traditional spinal fusion or less invasive Duke laser disc repair. This MRI represents a typical case with L45 and L5S1 symptomatic discs. A symptomatic disc causing neck or back pain can include bulging discs, herniated discs, ruptured discs, degenerative discs, protruding discs, spinal stenosis, radiculopathy, and sciatica.
This patient can choose traditional fusion surgery or the Duke laser disc repair to help alleviate the pain caused by and within the symptomatic discs. Here, two patients with comparable disc injuries are treated. On the left, the highly invasive spinal fusion, and on the right, the least invasive Duke laser disc repair. The spinal fusion requires a very large incision, usually leaving a large scar. The Duke laser disc repair requires only a very small incision, usually less than a half an inch long. In this small opening, a cylindrical rod, called a dilator, is inserted to gently spread the muscle to create a small passage and guide through which the surgery is performed endoscopically. The incision for the fusion continues, including penetrating the skin, fat tissue, and multiple layers of muscle through to the bone. With the Duke laser disc repair, a mallet is used to advance the tip of the dilator into the symptomatic disc. A tube, called the tubular retractor, slides over the dilator and is carefully positioned into the disc, again using the mallet. The rest of the entire Duke laser disc repair surgery will occur inside this narrow tube. To access the spine, the spinal fusion requires the muscle to be separated from the vertebrae. This very invasive action causes trauma and permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas in the endoscopic Duke laser disc repair, the muscle is not damaged. The endoscope camera is inserted into the tubular retractor to allow the surgeon to guide the laser inside each symptomatic disc. To accommodate the fusion hardware, a large bone grabber is used to perform a laminectomy by removing bone from the spine. The fiber optic laser used in the Duke laser disc repair is manipulated with great accuracy to remove only painful inflammatory tissue from the disc. In this highly magnified view, the laser is used to precisely remove damaged disc material that is causing the pain. The laser is debreeding, or essentially vaporizing, damaged tissue in the disc's outer layer, or annulus, specifically at the annular tear, the source of the rupture or herniation and pain. After the fusion patient's damaged discs are removed, a metal or plastic cage housing bone grafting material is inserted in place of the removed discs. Once the laser has removed the painful part of the annular tear, the endoscope and tubular retractor are removed, leaving less than one half inch incision in the skin, which is closed with a single stitch, strips, and a band-aid. Total time for the Duke laser disc repair surgery, approximately one hour. The fusion, however, is still underway. Holes in the spine must be tapped in preparation for the large pedicle screws that anchor the fusion hardware. The Duke laser disc repair patient is in recovery usually 45 to 60 minutes before release to go home. The fusion screws are inserted into the bone, as shown in the x-ray. After all screws are in place, rods are used to connect the screws together to prevent movement of the secured vertebrae. Cross links are added to bridge the rods together for additional stability. Fusion hardware, by design, is to fuse joints that normally move, preventing natural movement in the damaged portion of the spine. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no loss of movement. Normal movement and flexibility of the disc and joints is preserved. The Duke laser disc repair patient is soon back home, enjoying life, with a very fast recovery, allowing normal activities without pain. Meanwhile, bone graft material is placed throughout the fusion surgery site. These morselized pieces of bone will eventually grow together to help promote the fusion process. Prior to closing the wound, a temporary drain is installed to allow excess fluid to drain. Average surgery time of a traditional two-level fusion is two and a half hours, with an additional three to four hours in the recovery room. As we've seen in comparison, a spinal fusion requires a much larger incision and results in a significant amount of scar tissue. The Duke laser disc repair's half-inch incision leaves no scar tissue around the spine or nerves. A large amount of bone is removed with a spinal fusion. With the Duke laser disc repair, no bone is removed. Each disc is accessed through a natural opening in the spine. The entire disc is completely removed in a spinal fusion, even though only 5% may be damaged. The Duke laser disc repair leaves the normal parts of the disc in place and removes only the painful annular tear on the damaged disc. Fusion requires hardware, including screws, rods, plates, etc. The Duke laser disc repair does not require any hardware. The patient is totally hardware free. Fusion surgery is very invasive. Cutting and moving the muscle structures and tissues for a spinal fusion causes trauma resulting in permanent damage to the muscles. 
whereas with the Duke Laser Disc Repair, there is no damage to the muscles. The Duke Laser Disc Repair is the least invasive surgery available to repair a damaged disc. With spinal fusions, patients are required to take highly addictive narcotic painkillers, which can cause constipation, bowel, and bladder complications. Due to the minimal pain, narcotics are not needed with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. Spinal fusions have a high risk for infection. The Duke Laser Disc Repair has a very low risk for infection. In the seven years the Duke Laser Disc Repair has been performed, there have been no infections. Spinal fusion surgery has a very long recovery and requires a great deal of physical therapy and time to heal from the trauma in the muscles and the spine itself. Whereas the recovery from Duke Laser Disc Repair is in a matter of hours or days, rather than weeks or months. With fusion, the spine is being fused together, losing movement. Whereas there is no fusion with the Duke Laser Disc Repair, normal movements of the joints in the spine is preserved. Spinal fusion results in loss of mobility. There is no mobility loss with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. In fact, most Duke Laser Disc Repair patients experience improved mobility after the surgery. The Duke Laser Disc Repair is FDA approved. All the instruments and equipment used are FDA approved. This proprietary surgery itself has been peer-reviewed and published and is performed exclusively at the Duke Spine Institute. With the highest published success rate of 95%, the Duke Laser Disc Repair is proven to be the most successful and least damaging spinal surgery in the world for the treatment of symptomatic damaged discs causing back pain, neck pain, sciatica, and radiculopathy due to herniated, degenerated, or bulging discs. I'm Dr. R. Digmajan, and surprise, here I am outside the operating room here to talk to you and answer your questions. We have just finished a patient's surgery that came from North Carolina because he had herniated discs in his lower back, three of them to be exact, L3-4, L4-5, L5-S1. And he's had back pain for about four years. It's, you know, he's dealt with it, kind of just changed his lifestyle, but, um, Recently, and about a couple of weeks ago, he re-herniated and pushed out some more herniations, and those herniations were hitting on the nerves that are going down his leg. And you can see, I'm going to show you this model just here for a second. You can actually see bones. These are called vertebrae, and then between them is something called the disc. And that's where the problem is. The disc gets herniated, and the way that happens is uh, you get a tear, in the disc can you all see that yeah so right there you see that little red thing and then when you pick something up or load your spine it literally squeezes jelly out right there you guys see the jelly squeezing out squeeze see it squeezing out with bending all right well hopefully you saw it that activity of tearing the annular wall then bending lifting and pushing the jelly through the wall, that's the herniation. And people ask me all the time, is a bulging disc the same as a herniated disc? Absolutely, it is the same. Bulging discs are small. Technically, you could say a bulging disc is contained. What does contained mean? It means that it's underneath the posterior longitudinal ligament, which is a ligament that runs down the back of the, the spine. Uh, but contained herniations cause back pain, horrible back pain, and that's what everybody doesn't understand. You talk to surgeons, they'll say you have a small disc bulge, it couldn't be causing any problems. Wrong. It is causing problems. It can cause back pain, it can cause leg pain, and even it can bulge out when you're standing and walking to the point where it could hit the nerve and cause leg symptoms. So this patient today had, um, I'm going to show you right here, kind of a side view. You've got the back of the spine, side of the spine, and front of the spine. And the herniation is sort of in the middle, which is the back of the disc, and it hits on the nerve, which is the yellow thing that goes down the leg. So what we did today was unique. Instead of coming through the back and removing bones and ligament to get to the herniation, I used a transferaminal technique to come from the side, which was originally published by Dr. Parvis Cambin and I got underneath the nerve and I basically used the laser to zap the herniation out, okay? And that's gonna get the pressure off the nerve and it's gonna fix the back pain. Um, how do I know it's gonna fix his back pain? 
I've been doing this a long time. Herniated discs are the most common cause of back pain. And he had three of them. And we tested those three discs and indeed they were causing his typical back pain because I reproduced it. He had 10 out of 10 pain on the discogram and it was concordant, meaning it's typical back pain. That's a very, very strong indicator, strongest indicator in the world that those herniated discs are the cause of his back pain. There's no test better than a discogram, evocative discogram. All right, we just finished the surgery and um, it took us about an hour, a little bit over an hour to do the surgery and he'll spend an hour recovering and then he's gonna go home with his family. Again, he has his wife and two lovely kids are here with them to support him. It's a beautiful thing to see the whole family here taking care of dad. Um, and then uh, he can go back to North Carolina tomorrow after I check him out in the office in the morning. Any questions? Yes, we do have one from uh, Gail Clark on Facebook. Hi Gail, thanks for typing a question in. And they ask, doctor, what if uh, there is some desiccation of a disc? Is it hopeless? No, great question, Gail. I get questions all the time about uh, degenerative disc disease and whether or not it can be fixed with a laser surgery or anything. The answer is yes, degenerative disc disease, 100% we can fix it and get rid of your pain. Not a problem, it's easy to do. What is degenerative disc disease? Well, degenerative disc disease is, uh, and I've been saying this for a long time, it all starts with an annular tear and then a herniation. Remember from the videos we played earlier, once you get that nuclear material pushed through the tear, okay, you get that herniation. So here's the wall, here's the jelly. You rip it, you rip the wall through an annular tear, trauma, you know, if you don't know what causes trauma, here's what you do. Go on on a YouTube and watch something called Fail Army. Fail Army. Type it into YouTube. You're going to see people doing all kinds of crazy stuff, all right? And that's trauma. And when you get a trauma like that to your disc, you rip the annulus, and then you go bend and pick something up later on, like a piece of wood or whatever, that will push the jelly through the tear. Now, once the jelly is stuck in the tear, it creates inflammation and back pain. That's what we discovered at Duke Spine Institute. I discovered it 16 years ago. And we've published this surgery where I go in with the laser and I clean all the jelly out, clean the tear, and I let the tear reheal its, reseal itself. Degenerative disc disease and desiccation of the disc is just a progression of that inflammatory process that's happening at the back of the disc where there's inflammation and the chemicals from inflammation get into the disc over time through diffusion and they destroy the jelly. And the jelly just dries up and that's called desiccation. Desiccation is when you lose water. So the bones come down together, you get a, a, a flattening of the disc, you get a dark color of the disc on the MRI, you get bone spurs, they start to form. There's little lips right here off the bottom of the bone, up the end plates. All of these things don't matter. In the end, I can take the most degenerated disc there is. No disc material left, totally collapsed, bone on bone. I can go in, find the tear, it's still there, and remove it with the laser, and the pain goes away. And the degeneration's still there, by the way. The desiccation, degeneration, I don't touch it, and the pain's gone. Why? because they're not causing the pain. The only thing causing the pain is the tear. And I've been saying this for 15 years now. And um, unfortunately, most doctors don't listen. And, you know, we can only spread so much word here, but the word needs to get out so people understand. There is hope. We can fix your problem. Come to Duke Spine Institute. And Gail had a follow-up question. She said, I'm in New York. I have two MRIs taken in the last two years. Can I send those uh, for review? If hopeful at all, I can get, uh, I can get another. Possible? Thanks Hi, Gail. Um, Gail asked, she said, I've got two MRIs. I'm in New York, and I'd like to send them to you for you to look at, see if you can help me. 100%, that's what we do. We um, do MRI reviews. It's free. We don't charge. It's virtual for anybody. We do MRI reviews people all over the world, whether you're in Pakistan, Abu Dhabi, Canada, South America, Asia. Literally, we do every week MRI reviews. We do, uh, right now we're doing about 30 a week and um, we'll review your MRI and we'll give you our advice, answer your questions. You get about 10, 10 minutes with me 
uh, face to face and we do that as a you know charity community service whatever you want to call it just helping people out because most people don't come for any surgery or treatment they can't make it but that's fine we don't expect them to we just want to help people learn the truth about their back pain and neck pain so yes send your MRI in if you go to the dukespine.com website d-e-u-k spine.com website you'll see there's an opportunity it says free MRI review click on it it's a banner and then it'll open up a page and allow you to upload your MRI images and it'll ask you a few questions like you have back pain you have neck pain arm pain leg pain etc so go ahead and do that it'll take 10 minutes to fill out and get your images swept in if you can't um, sweep your images off your CD onto our web portal then just send us your CD uh, to the Duke Spine Institute MRI review okay great questions thank you for asking I think we're done so we're gonna wrap this surgery up our next patient comes from Turkey uh, Istanbul and he has two hernia actually he has three herniated discs he's only getting two out of the three fix and that's fine um, that's all he wanted to get done and um, you know some people only have the financial means to fix two discs out of three there's not much we can do about that but we do what we can because fixing two discs is still going to give them a lot of relief anyway he's from turkey and he flew to orlando just to have his back fixed with the duke laser disc repair it just goes to show you people that are knowledgeable about their back pain and the duke laser disc repair that's what they want done and they'll fly from the ends of the earth here to orlando to get this surgery because they've done their research and they know the alternatives are horrible you know fusion surgeries or uh, endoscopic surgery elsewhere i got people writing me on facebook begging me to help them but they're like in india you know or they're in pakistan or they're in some foreign country and they've had endoscopic surgery with some other doctor who just botched the surgery up you know and the doctor doesn't even call them back he just writes them for pain pills and I see this all the time, whether it's artificial disc failures, fusion failures, laminectomy failures, microdiscectomy failures, endoscopic surgery failures. There's so many bad surgeons out there. So it's not just the surgery. You want to make sure you got a surgeon who's good. As a matter of fact, I work alone. And people may wonder, why am I the only surgeon at Duke Spine? Because I don't trust the other surgeons. Um, I've tried hiring spine surgeons, neurosurgeons, and honest to God, they scare the hell out of me because they're so, um, many of them are so incompetent skill-wise and yet they'll never admit it. They think they're great. They've done their neurosurgery training and honest to God, my neurosurgery training was number one in the country when I did it at UF in Gainesville. These people are training out of 100 training programs. They're training in the bottom 10%, 20%, 30% and they think they know and they're prepared to do excellent surgery even though they haven't been trained properly. They're just, they don't accept the fact that there's so much more they still have to learn. So they're dangerous. These people are dangerous and I won't let them anywhere near my patients. So um, I've had to make the choice over the years to not hire neurosurgeons and orthopedic spine surgeons because they suck. And they're most importantly though, they're not willing to learn. And if you're not willing to learn new things as a doctor, you're not going to be a good doctor. I'm sorry. Uh, I always take the time to learn new stuff. A lot of it I don't, I don't do. I don't do some of the newer procedures. Like people ask me, do you do the mild procedure? Hell no. It doesn't work. It's garbage. It's designed for one purpose, to make the people who make the kit rich. Those are the manufacturers. There are so many manufacturers in spine surgery and all they're after is the almighty dollar. They don't care if their product doesn't work. Well, I do because I got to answer to the patients. And uh, my daddy taught me right. He was a doctor. He said, always do what's best for the patient. And I believed him. I listened to him. And that's what I've done. And it's made me very successful at fixing people because you really focus on what's best for the patient, not what's best for you, the doctor, financially, you focus on what's best for the patient. Um, a lot of pain management clinics, they'll just use you as a patient. They'll use you to get bill your insurance for procedures that don't work. And by the time you're done with them, you'll have had four or five procedures. And you'll end up with a spinal cord stimulator, which doesn't work. And by the time they're done with you, they would have made $20,000 off you. 
that's not right it's right to make money but it's not right to do the wrong procedure on a patient to make money that's not right that's unethical unfortunately many doctors don't understand that or don't see it that way so why do we do these broadcasts we're not just teaching you about spine surgery we're teaching you about how, how unethical the spine world really is and you really need to find that oasis in the desert that's going to help you Duke Spine Institute is that oasis and that's why I believe so much in what we do as an organization that's why we broadcast okay so we'll be back in 30 minutes with the next surgery patients from Turkey it's two lumbar discs we'll be doing the Duke laser disc repair